Gonna need more cowbell. Hi, Misha here, and gonna do quite a long video looking at the two waves of 7-inch scale figures from McFarlane for Dune Parts 1 and 2. And uh, these are actually pretty affordable, especially if you bought them on discount sale. There's some pros and cons, but I'll be honest, I kind of think they're nicer than I was expecting. And I just wanted to have some fun. Um, Dune is something that I first read as a child in the 80s, and I've read the first one maybe three, four times. The other one's less, probably the least God Emperor. I think I appreciate it more as an adult adult, but as a kid, not so much. But anyway, we'll, you know, I'll mention that a few times here and there. But, um, yeah, we'll go over the figures a little bit, talk about what makes them different. I've customized them a little bit, too. I don't know. If you like, like, share, subscribe. And uh, if you want to check out, there's Patreon over at Mishiko. You can toss it in. With that, let's just dive into Dune. Well, we have to begin with Paul, the first Paul. Essentially, still Paul Atreides. And a couple of disclosures. Typically in my videos I cover more technical aspects with the you know, non-fiction airplane videos. Even if I do fiction, typically sci-fi, I uh, try to focus on, on the technical. But Frank Herbert didn't put a lot of technical details into his novels, any of them. I've read most of what he's written. And he was not even a plot or character guy. He was a world guy, but mostly a, a philosophy and idea guy. Really, the one piece of technology he really does focus on is the still suit, but we'll get to that in a minute. But it's interesting, the future feudal world, because we have atomics. I always thought it was interesting that there were family atomics. Just to give some context, yeah, when I was little, the first Dune movie, 1984, David Lynch, which, by the way, I'm a David Lynch fan. Uh, one of his favorites of mine is uh, Lost Highway. Of course, Twin Peaks is a thing and really fun. But um, that was out. And I had read the books. The first book I've probably read three to four times in my life now. Not a huge number. And... Uh, the first couple of sequels a couple of times, and uh, I'll be honest, probably God Emperor only once full through, maybe spot here and there, but it's, um, I think as, a, as an older adult, it would appeal to me more when I was a teenager, meant less so. Anyway, the universe we live in, one thing, you know, the, the Brian Herbert books, the Kevin J. Anderson, again, I've read Kevin J. Anderson's other books, and uh, he has some decent ones. He's no Peter Hamilton, but, you know, hey. I, they miss it. The, the, the Butlerian Jihad wasn't Terminator. Not in Frank Herbert. No, it was more like Wally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the cartoon, Wally. It was where humans had become lackadaisical, apathetic, lazy because of machines. And some humans controlling or being controlled by machines. Either way, computers thinking machines had been detrimental to humanity. So there was a pogrom, essentially, a uh, futuristic book burning, if you will, where the computers were all tossed in. There's really no evidence in the Frank Herbert books of robots fighting humans in that direct sense. If there were... They were probably robots being directed by humans, or vice versa, humans being directed by robots. But that's the biggest problem I have with the uh, with the Butlerian Jihad books is it just it just doesn't quite get it, unfortunately. And that's a shame because the the you know computer robot overlords thing. I'm not gonna say it's been done to death, but it's been done quite a bit especially by the time the prequel books came out in the 21st century. Oh, well. 
you can't expect Brian Herbert to have Frank Herbert's axe to grind. Also, Brian Herbert didn't grow up in the 60s. By the way, if you, Dune doesn't make sense to you, especially like God Emperor, that level of Dune, don't worry, just drop some acid. Ser seriously, uh, Frank Herbert did drugs. That, I know, shocker. Yeah, that that is the product of a mind. But I would even say that almost goes for all of 60s science fiction. Uh, Philip K. Dick, of course, but even Arthur Clarke, and to a lesser extent, Isaac Asimov. But it was the time, it was the place, and those are the people. That's the, kind of the trick of understanding 60s sci-fi. Let's talk about Todd McFarlane. So with that out of the way, this is the first figure in the first wave from 2020, the 2021 film. And, you know, pros and cons. It's a 7-inch tall figure which would be about a 110 scale, give or take. Something that really McFarland started and then NECA kept on with. It's an interesting scale. And, um, you know, pros and cons to these. I know some people, especially with the Wave 1, talk about the paint. Luckily, since I'm blind, keep that in mind as we do this video, that'll happen. You know, if you just wet it, I was about to take it off the stand. Now, the stand's usually held pretty good, but this is a little uneven. And uh, this one is a little splayed as I was trying to put him in a more of a combat pose. And uh, this is where it begins. Now, he's in a still suit. We'll talk about those in a minute. He does have this face mask, which is part of the reclamation system. You can't actually take it out by popping the head. But the articulation is actually better than I was expecting with these. Um, the double joints do pretty well on the arms. And the, uh, the wrists are actually quite good. They, they're really good for this kind of knife fighting stance. You can flex them, they rotate. And I do like that the joints are pretty much all on a ratchet. Not much up here, but it doesn't really need to be. And uh, the feet do move. And uh, there's toe articulation, which is, I guess, good for posing. Cause you can do that. This isn't the worst toe articulation I've seen. But um, it is what it is. One thing that actually did impress me are the accessories. As we go through these, you're going to see that they actually gave pretty much every figure unique accessories but now the only other mcfarland we've looked at on the channel were the doom figures and they're kind of the opposite they almost all got the same accessory once in a while they'd break it up but here i'm actually very happy that uh, each one does in although in wave one we're going to see a lot of repeat on the the body suit itself but yeah, he comes with the kind of two combat knives plus a chris knife and uh the mask. Keep in mind, too, these were, you know, $20 figures, retail, full. You could find them on sale for $15, pretty easy. So we're not talking even as expensive as Black Series or the modern G.I. Joe. So I'll give a little bit of allowance. And they do come with a base, which is more than you can say for a lot of figures these days. And again, when it's actually on a flat surface, it, it's fine. It's just... Kind of had him standing in a weird position. And I do like the pegs on these. They, they peg in quite nicely. Nice and tight without being excruciating. But this is essentially Paul from the first film. His hair isn't quite as messy as we'll see. Original eye color. But yeah, the... At the beginning of the film, of course, we see them fighting with Holtzman shields. The idea, of course, is penetration of the shield with a blade. You could use a laser or a LAS gun, but uh, that would make a nuclear explosion in the uh, Duneverse, so you don't do that. 
Dart weapons are a thing, but because shields block fast moving projectiles, you, they, there's a certain maximum speed. Now, the idea was shields would let slower moving things in. Like if you wanted to push your hand or hand someone some food or something just casual, slide them a glass or something, you can slide it through the shield. The shields were alert for fast moving objects like bullets or, you know, thrown knives. So it introduces an interesting type of medieval combat, but also combined with the increased reflexes and training after 10,000 years of practice. So these aren't your average humans. But yeah, I do like this one. It has this very traditional Kaladin, Kaladinian imperial type, just combat knives. They look like regular knives. And kind of the same goes for our next one. Next in wave one, let's talk about Duncan Potato, Duncan Idaho. Interesting character that really got expanded upon after the first book, even by Frank Herbert. He becomes a, actually a much more important character as the series goes on, arguably more important than Paul even. And in media, he's become more and more important in the 84 film, he was there. That's about it. And he was a little more in the 2000 sci-fi miniseries. By the way, the sci-fi miniseries, when it came out, I, I enjoyed it. It kind of took me a minute to figure out why I enjoyed it more than most people. When you look at the positives, they talk about, you know, being faithful to the book, the overall acting, the slower pace, you know, the more world building. The negatives were costume designs, the CGI, and other visuals. So, okay, I get it. And even I'll admit, some of the line deliveries weren't the best. But again, it was a sci-fi miniseries. What do you expect? Anyway, in 2000, that era, we didn't have quite the selection we do today. We had David Lencer's Dune, and we had that. So, in most ways, it was a little more grounded. And he was in it more. Now, in the current series of films, Idaho being portrayed by Jason Momoa, one of the few I actually know, I think a lot of the actors in this are from superhero movies. And if that's your jam, that's cool. A lot of my family like the superheroes. I think it's a generational thing. I'm into sci-fi. I don't really do a lot with superheroes. It's just, you know, we all have our interests and we can't all be into everything. That's why I know Jason Momoa, because I remember when he got his start in season two of Stargate Atlantis. And I'm happy the guy's had a good career. Seems like a nice dude. Anyway, he's on kind of the second body mold for the fir first series. The, the kind of larger still suit. Same articulation. A little bit more restricted in some areas just because of the added bulk. Still pretty good on, like, the legs and stuff, though. I guess it's about as far as that articulates. And uh, he comes with two essentially oriental-looking, or Asiatic-looking swords. I almost want to say katanas, but not really. There's a little bit of European rapier influence going on. Anyway, a short sword and a long sword. And he also comes with the uh, the mask. Again, you can pop these heads off very easily and take the uh, filter mask off. Yeah, pretty standard. But um, I do wish they came with sheaths for their blades. That's my one complaint. I. I wasn't really expecting them, but it would have been a nice surprise if they did. I'm not even sure if they had cheese in the movie, though, so... Eh. But I, I like weapon storage on anything. I just... I like being able to keep all the accessories with the figure. And, uh... I like to sometimes have their hands free. Tight there on that. The uh, shoulder joints are a little stiff on this one, apparently. Good. Kind of thigh rotation now. 
Again, articulation is better than I expected. Maybe I was thinking of like the old statue style McFarlane figures. But, uh, you know, I, Duncan Idaho was trained in the, the Imperial way. He was a 10th level Guinness master. Essentially a, a sword master. And I did like the more elder brother role he took in the new films. He's a thoroughly likable and charismatic and even in the books is described as very attractive character. And he dies taking out many Sadakar. And of course there's one other kind of main teacher confidant of Paul. It's worth pointing out that we never really see friends of his own age because he's the heir, he's the duke apparent, and so he has teachers and mentors more than he has friends. It's time to talk about Gurney Halleck, Gurneyman. Kind of the opposite of Duncan, but also the same. About as skilled, but in a less polished, more, uh, you know, real world fighting style. Whereas Duncan is the sword master, he's the war master. Of course, very famously portrayed by Patrick Stewart in the original film. He does get more screen time than the others. And then, of course, in the new films, he's there quite a bit. He was actually more in part two than I was expecting. And through for how it, the Mintat was less. But then again, I kind of get it. It was getting crowded enough. Now, this character is actually from Series 2. And this one's from the 2-pack with Beast Ribbon. In fact, I don't believe they've released a Gurney in a single pack. I think he's always carded with someone else. It's essentially the same body as Duncan Idaho. Different paint scheme, of course, a different head. He doesn't have the face mask. In the film, he's having a harder time adapting to the Fremen ways, but we'll get there. Now, you might think he has the same swords as Duncan, but he actually doesn't. These are different molds. Again, that's what it, it does impress me that they actually gave different ones. And his is a little bit more of a rapier style. It's kind of interesting. They're a little more mismatched. One has more of a square grip. One has more rounded, whereas Idaho's were both kind of look to be a pair. These look like just a couple of swords he got. I'm actually very curious why they didn't give him a battle set, though. That would have been cool. One sword and a battle set would have been neat. And they're not done with the series, maybe, so we'll see. But yeah, same articulation. Nothing much to say here. He's kind of got the ragamuffin hair going on because he's been in the desert. But then again... He was always a little unkempt and grumpy. And that's most of the Atreides household. Although, of course, we have one more from back in Series 1. And I'm talking, of course, about the weirding witch, Lady Jessica. It's actually on the same body as Paul, for the most part. There's a couple of minor detail changes. But this is the first one I've somewhat a little bit customized. I took one of the soft goods from the Amazon pack and thought it would be good on her. Actually came off one of the poles, I believe. These are kind of neat because they are wired. When I read that they were wired, I was thinking they might be kind of clunky. But they actually use very thin wires in the seams, so they, uh, they're not too bad. She does have the face mask. Again, you can't take it off. And she actually comes with a crease knife, but I thought giving her an Atreides short sword would be a little more appropriate. I don't know. It's, I don't know. I wanted to give the crease knife to another Fremen anyway we'll get to. The only female we had in the first wave. Again, nothing really unique about this body. 
you actually came with one other accessory that I gave to someone else. Again, I, I felt no reason not to customize. One nice thing about these coming from a book, there's no like one right way for any of these to look. It's all interpretation. So, of course, we could talk about the weirding ways. We could talk about the weirding modules if we want, but uh, eh. That's a whole thing in and of itself, the Bene Gesserit. That's the thing. There's so much in there in each thing. And even like the Souk Doctors and stuff could be their own thing. And That's why I didn't mind Brian Herbert and Anderson trying to expand the uh, universe. Because it was definitely rich for the plundering, I just, uh, there were a couple of missteps, like I said, the, uh, the butlerian jihad, I just don't think that was quite in there. Other things could be put down to style or whatnot, and you could argue about that. But yeah, I do like these soft goods. Kind of makes it fun. It just to me, any of the Bene Gesserit, they're just kind of robed figures, and every media and description, they usually have a robe, and so it actually seems to fit pretty pretty well on her. I think it works. And kind of dis disguises the fact it's essentially the same body as Paul. Makes it a little different. I thought anyway. Your mileage may vary. One thing I think is funny is in every interpretation, they always pick someone with a British accent to be Jessica. I guess it's just kind of part of it. <laughs> Yeah, she really didn't get much to do in the second film. I will give that. I mean, she was there, but she was much more featured in the first. I did think it was kind of funny when the Duke said he wanted to be a pilot, of course referring to Star Wars, but also referring to the books where he is a pilot and at least some of the Literature, and if it's from the Brian, so kind of a double nod there, kind of cracked me up a little bit. Things to observe. But yeah, you kind of needed her. And you know, at least at least they would get her. Important enough. Her accessory should have been a tiny abomination child. What do you think? I did kind of miss the, oh yeah, I, uh, if, if there's one thing the the 84 Dune maybe got the best out of all of them, it was all, yeah. <laughs> right up for uh, David Lynch's alley. But um, we have one more out of four in the first wave. But I've actually already integrated him in with a different setup, so now we'll talk about the Fremen. Everyone's favorite Fremen, Stilgar. Yeah. He was the last one in the first wave, although I've started to do some stuff with him here, mostly different accessorizing, and I've put him on the uh, one of the environmental bases, as they called in the second wave. He again is on the same body as uh, Idaho, and for that matter, the later Gurney. And... Uh, I've given him a thumper, which actually came with the Amazon set, as did a maker hook. He also comes with a Chris knife, which I just kind of shoved back here. By the way, there were two types of Chris knife. There was fixed and unfixed, and the ones that were not fixed would actually dissolve if they weren't kept with their owners or human body. <laughs> and a unique accessory he comes with. Uh, Jessica came with one too, is the Frem Kit. This kind of neat little backpack. This was a desert survival backpack, so it wasn't really for combat, but it would uh, contain, of course, food and water rations. It would also contain a paracompass. It contained a still tent, which was well, exactly what it sounds like, a tent for conserving water where you could stay in overnight. Well, over day, technically, because Fremen travel at night. It contained a sand compactor, more important than you'd think in the desert. 
and uh, it contained a snorkel for, you know, burying your shelter in the sand and breathing, because breathing is also important. And yeah, it would often contain a maker hook and a thumper. The uh, maker hooks, of course, would compact down quite a bit. Fun fact, they're supposed to be made out of a spice material, <laughs> turned into kind of a thing. So yeah, I've kind of got him set up in more of a desert thing. He has the mask, and I gave him a hood. It's actually from the same robe that I took from Paul and gave to Jessica, but since it wouldn't fit over her hair, and he didn't have any head covering. Fun fact, too, that the, the still suits did not have gloves or headwear as such as part of the suits, although they would usually put on some type of head garment. They would almost always have the mask. And uh, they would usually put on gloves of whatever they had around. And if they needed bare hands, they would actually coat their hands in a type of uh, lacquer or grease or sap, which would protect their hands from sand. It would also protect moisture loss because, you know, the Fremen felt like the moisture wasn't really owned by the individual. It was owned by the tribe. So you were only renting it. Yeah. And by the way, they pretty much wore their still suits all the time, even in the sieges. He was the naive of siege Tabor. I was actually happy to see that they kind of kept his dynamic with Paul, including him wanting Paul to kill him, which was part of their traditions. Which definitely goes to show you some traditions are old and stupid, because killing Stilgar would have had horribly long-lasting effects. Yeah, I've customized his kit out here a bit. Again, he's kind of more of a desert crossing, not so much a combat stance. Uh, just a fighter. I mean, not, not a fighter, but yeah. And these bases are neat. Um... They're intentionally uneven, so you, if you really want to get dynamic, you can put their feet in a few places. I do kind of wish they gave multiple uh, pegs instead of just two, because the base is quite big. It would have been neat to spread them out, maybe because you could easily get three, maybe even four on the base. But our other member over here is from a pretty neat two-pack, honestly. This is Shishakli which uh, came in a two-pack with Stilgar, but not the Stilgar we just looked at. Yeah, there's a few different Stilgars. And uh, I couldn't actually find the two-pack for a minute. Uh, and then I looked on Amazon, and it was crazy expensive, like 70 bucks. Uh, no. I looked on it on uh, eBay, even more. Well, I guess I'm not getting it. Then I thought to actually check the McFarland store, 20 bucks for the two-pack, so $10 a figure. Yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> now, I... Uh, she, he in the books, but it doesn't really matter, was the one that gave Paul a uh, maker hook when he's learning how to ride and call a worm. That's why I actually gave her two. <laughs> it's a gender swap that really doesn't matter in the books. Uh, he's not really, if anything. It is unique head sculpt. This robe did actually come with her, which a lot of the uh, Fremen do wear. It's wired, too. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same body that we've seen. The smaller body. But then again, in still suits, they're going to pretty much all look the same. And you'll notice on the face, and you'll see this with Series 2 a lot, there's the wire running to what is a nose plug. That was part of the uh, moisture reclamation. You would uh, breathe in through your mouth and out through your nose, and it would capture any moisture going through your nose. This is actually a separate piece. Um, it doesn't come off, but it is flexible. You can move it around, so it's not, strictly speaking, molded to the face. And you could have both that and the mask and Fremen garb. The mask is just to kind of protect your mouth. And that's for your nose. But yeah, I thought this would be a neat one to have. And I've got both her and Stilgar kind of set up on this base as a worm riding duo. 
Because it's a very important art of, well, Fremen, being Fremen. And the uh, two pack did come with this base, so. This side's a little higher. So that's, um, that's Fremen kind of in the desert, surviving the desert and whatnot. Of course, still suits are very famous. They're a multi-layer garment that uh, reclaims moisture from sweat. Yes, urine. Yes, even feces, because you might be in them for days at a time. And uh, recycles it, filters out salts and everything, keeps it in bladders. And uh, that is why these figures do have kind of puffy areas, including there is a butt bladder, just so you know, or kind of above the butt, but still, it's you know, where they kept water. And it was supposedly powered by your own respiration and your own movement. In the real world, energy conservation wouldn't quite work out that nice, but again, this is sci-fi. And it is the one piece of technology that... Frank Herbert really did go into detail about, include, including even describing its color as kind of a grayish type. And them also wearing cloaks and having the uh, mask or you know mouth flap. Interestingly, no goggles. Um, I find that odd, including in the books or the, the films. You'd think goggles would be a thing. Although we did get a little more in the way of head coverings. And that actually kind of gets me to why I wanted the two-pack. Because it came with some kind of unique accessories. And as far as I can recall, it's the only one in the McFarland series to come with an extra head. And so here's my second twofer display on the other environmental base. One of these is Stilgar, at least in theory. And the other one is... Uh, more of a custom job I did to make generic Fremen fighter warrior person. And here they are. Now, I kind of had this idea, and it, I think it worked out pretty good. Let me know what you think. This is the second head of Shashak Lee. And uh, it's obviously quite well wrapped up, again, except for the eyes. Now we have this kind of antenna. For communications, because you do see comms in the desert, especially in part two. But you can't really put the cloak hood over, so that's why I left the cloak on the one with the more exposed face, and then this one here covered up. Pretty nondescript. I gave it a crease knife, because pretty much all Fremen are going to have this. And made from the tooth of a maker, a sandworm. It's supposed to be very pointy, very sharp. I wonder how well it cuts, though. We see it poking a lot, but anyway. As for the body, I actually had a extra Paul body from the Amazon pack. That's why I took the robe off and gave parts to Jessica and the first Stilgar. Kind of leaving this one unencumbered and just in a still suit. And so, yeah, this is just kind of my generic male or female, if you whichever. Fremen Warrior. I try to keep it without. I thought about giving it a fem pack, but or fem pack, but I wanted to keep it free for movement, for posing if we want. And the uh, I do like the articulation, the kind of ratcheting wrist these have. Makes. Poking knives and stuff more effective. Again, pretty pretty good double jointed legs there. Kind of makes me wonder how flexible still suits are. <laughs> yeah, what do you think? I just kind of wanted a Fremen. I, I would also love to have had like a, a standard Atreides soldier, standard Harkonnen soldier, and most importantly, I would have loved to have had a Sardaukar. But we don't really have troop builders in this series. Almost everyone is a named character of sorts, which is good and bad. I get it. But, yeah. 
Let's look at another Stilgar. Essentially the one that came in the two pack is the same body, but we have a new head. We still have the mask. We have the nose plug now that the first one didn't have, and we have this more head covering, and we have the antenna on uh, his head too. So it's a unique head, and it came with a unique weapon. Actually, the pack came with two of these. These are those rocket launchers they use in part two a couple of times to shoot down Harkonnen vehicles, and I believe the Sardaukar too. It is a big, solid hunk of plastic but it doesn't feel cheap it's actually quite quite chunky and solid you'd expect something like this this thick to maybe be hollow or whatnot but it's out of a single mold and quite heavy got some wrappage i looked online to see if there was a name for this i i couldn't find one just the dune 2 rocket launcher i will say that rocket launchers were in a lot of the earlier media, especially the expanded universe, I know the the Dune video games had them, and uh, I believe a, a type of kinetic projectile launcher weapon like this was in the books, but I could be wrong. But uh, either way, I thought it was a neat pack because you got the extra head, and I kind of, like I said, wanted to. I had that thought in mind already. And uh, I always like to have more Fremen, and I thought having this launcher was neat. And again, it was 20 bucks, so why not? Enough knew that I was happy enough to find it. But what do you think? It's been a minute since we've looked at a poll, so let's return for Series 2's poll. I guess this would be Paul Moadib as he's becoming, you know, Usul, middle of his journey. And it has some... Improvements from the first one. Of course, we have the soft goods, and he actually comes with the two, one under another, and a hood. I, I think it's funny that the, uh, yeah, it's a little stuck on him, I'm going to pry it off. The hair is a little more must underneath. We'll look at another one in a minute with it. But he has the nose plug now, no mask. And he comes with a big sword, which, is that... Sadakar or Harkonnen? Can't quite decide. It's kind of neat though. It's a unique sword to this one figure. So between the robes and the you know the blue eyes and a little bit better detail, even though the body underneath is essentially the same. The accoutrement help. And keep in mind too, this was released what, three years, three and a half after the first one, so wasn't back to back. And this would be Paul in more of a desert garb, still in a still suit, of course. And that's accurate to the film. The, the Fremen pretty much don't leave their still suits. But yeah, I think it's neat. And again, not very much money, especially if you buy in bulk or on clearance. And now let's look at our first Chani or Chaney, if you prefer. I think Chani sounds better, but I think Herbert actually said Chaney. And uh, the actress, I'm not really familiar with her. Apparently people know who she is. One of those one name people like Cher, but I'm getting too old to keep track. And in the first film, she wasn't in it much, to be fair, so yeah. I wasn't sure. I will say she did a, I think, a, it wasn't a traditional Chani, but it was a better thing in at least, I guess you would say the chemistry, the interactions were better. For what it's worth, uh, the uh, Shishakali, or Shishakali, whatever person that we just looked at, um, was one of her friends that sacrificed herself, killing, uh, what, nine, ten Sardaukar before they took her over. And, uh, yeah, pretty much the same deal. Uh, soft goods. Of course, a new head sculpt. Comes with a crease knife, but what else? And I put a pistol in her hand. Now, this did not come with McFarlane. It's a little small. Uh, you may or may not recognize where it's from, but it is from the Dune universe. And I wanted to represent a Mala pistol because there are small assassin pistols that fire needles, essentially. Kinetic needle type things 
Yeah, they hold a 10 per clip, as they call them. And uh, we do see them at the end of the first film and in the second. And we, the Fremen definitely have them, but they're a bit of a badge of honor. I thought this kind of fit her well enough because they're, they're not very big. About uh, about 8 inches in the in universe, maybe 10 on the outside. So... Yeah, I thought it'd be neat to give someone a, a gun type thing. And of course she's just in a regular cloak and kind of the same body we've looked at. Yeah, this one probably comes with the least unique stuff because it just has a crease knife. Um, so really just the, the head and the robe is new. The body and everything are same as we've had before. It does come with the environmental base, though, just like Paul, so that's kind of nice, I suppose. People seem to like the bases. I'm, I'm fine either way. The single ones are a little better. They take up less space. I have one more Chani to show you. The first one was more in combat. This is more in desert travel mode. And this came in the Amazon pack. It actually has a different robe, and it's easier to get the hood up on this one. Came with a maker hook and a thumper. And I gave her the frim kit that Jessica initially came with. Just because I wanted to kind of kit her out. I think it turned out pretty well, but let me know what you think. I just, I don't know. I had the figures and kind of like doing a little light customiz customizing. I mean, this isn't really customizing, but you know what I mean. Moving a few things around. Something is hooked up on something. What am I? Oh, the uh, thread on this is hooked on the base. These are back. The Amazon ones just come with the standard Dune marked bases. I will say that Series 2, which this is technically part of, all come with the uh, kind of cards, kind of 90 style trading cards. Yeah, pretty well the same head sculpt. Again, same body. And again, the robe is different, though, which kind of surprised me. I wasn't expecting that. But I do like the posable wire. It's kind of fun. A lot of things you can, you can do with it. The maker hooks are neat, I think. Just uh, desert living. Ah, there's a little bit of a plastic burr on the bottom of the base. I'll hit that with the file. Yeah, that's the other uh, Chani from Series 2. And also from the Amazon pack, and the only reason I bought it is I found it cheap, and I thought, well, it'd be neat to have the accessories and, and the bodies for some fodder. We have another Stilgar. And this one actually surprised me. While it's essentially on the same body, and we have essentially the same head as we've had a couple of times before, this is a different kind of layout. In the second movie, we see them with some armor on. I've read that some say it was maybe for worm riding to be more secure in the sands. Maybe that was the original thing. It was also well, armor, doing armor things, which would make sense. A still suit is a survival suit, but it's not really meant for fighting. It allows for decent flexibility, but you wouldn't want to get it stabbed or you lose your water reclamation. So here we have this big plate on the back here and here we have the most important piece of armor at the crotch we have it up here we have on the shoulders yeah it's it's a pretty different looking figure and even though this is mostly just an overlay of the existing body it to me gives it a very different look also a very bulky look we could say that either the Fremen already had this armor or it's a Atreides influence from Paul doesn't really matter and uh, so I just have him kind of in a very stripped down mode here with his crease knife. A little bit more restrictive on the moves just because of the extra armor. But again, oh, and he has kind of this hood or thing, or maybe it's meant to be like a neck guard where his head's buried in there. Yeah, I just I wasn't expecting him to have a kind of totally different look to him. That's kind of neat. Even though we've had a number of Stilgars, it seems like each one does have its own look, and, and that's fine. 
I, I wouldn't like it in a black series where, good grief, they're 25 30 bucks each and usually don't get any accessories. But in something like this where you get two or three accessories with each one and they're 15 to 20 bucks each, I guess I'm a little more forgiving. Anyway, there was one more in the Amazon pack. In essentially the same armored up still suit as Stilgar there, we have another gurney. I thought giving him the second rocket launcher from the other two pack would be kind of fitting. He actually came with two swords. One I just kind of used some twine to put around his leg. Again, I really do wish they had cheese. And the other one I gave to Jessica. Again, Atreides. Why not? It's nice to see Gurney getting representation. When uh, LJN did the original figures back in the 80s, they were going to do a Gurney in a Wave 2, but since a lot of that film, including the toys, were, were a failure, they didn't. It would have been funny to see a Patrick Stewart, but oh well. At least we got a couple now. But yeah, this one's more from the Desert Combat the other one would be more from the ending scenes of Dune Part 2. It's nice to have a couple of gurneys. Again, and I'm, I'm happy the Amazon pack actually was neater than I expected. It, having different robes for Paul and Johnny and having uh, different armor for Stilgar and Gurney. Plus, it came with a total of four maker hooks, two thumpers, uh, a couple of swords, a Chris knife, some cards. Yeah, for like 40 bucks total, it was fine. 10 bucks per figure. I don't think I'd pay the full 70 when it's not on sale, but when it is, yeah, why not? Things like these tend to go out of print and then go up real quick as the movies kind of fall out of fashion. It's a way of things. I believe the head's the same. It may be slightly different. Not much movement in there just because of the neck piece. I actually thought about putting a Patrick Stewart head on this just for fun. Ah, <laughs> uh, Gurney. He just wasn't meant for the desert. Makes sense, though. From Giddy Prime to Caladan to Tyrakis, that was maybe one move too many for him. But at least he got to live. Um, better than you could say for Duncan or... Yeah, Thufer or... Even... The traitor himself. Sorry, I was just thinking. Waiting on FedEx here. Dr. Yui. Wellington Yui. By the way, that originally was played by Owl from Quantum Leap. Okay, you know what I mean. That's the fun thing about David Lynch's thing. A lot of people would go on to certain levels of fame or what have you from that show. <laughs> and, um... I believe that's all the Fremen and Atreides we have. Again, we have some repeats and whatnot, but at least when they do one, it's different. I think Wave 2 is shaping it better than Wave 1. We see more body molds. We see more interesting things. But now we have to talk about the baddies of the film. Because really in Wave 1, we didn't get any. Well, we got one, kind of. But in Wave 2, we got a few. So, moving on to... The Beast Raban. Glossu Raban. Count of the Harkonnen. Or Harkonnen, if you want to go for the 80s pronunciation. And not going to take him off the stand, because he doesn't come with one. This is the Build-A-Figure. And actually, the, my first and so far and the only build figure. Like I said, I'm just not into superheroes. It's not a dig against anyone who is. I just I want to repeat that not because I don't want to get in a fight, because I seriously don't want to... One of my mantras in life is just because I'm not into something or don't like something, you know, music's a good example. I don't want to rain on someone else's parade. So my point is, though, McFarland does quite a few build figures or whatever they call them for the superhero stuff, but uh, since I haven't done that, I, done, you know, I didn't really know what to expect, but he came in four chunks with the uh, other figures. For example, I think it was Paul that had the two legs, Stilgar had the torso, and uh, we can't remember who had the arms. I think it was Duncan. 
And I think Jessica had the head, but what was kind of neat, she also came with the accessories, which would have been handy to have anyway, which was his uh, ink vine whip and his very crude choppy choppy sword, almost like a cleaver, but it fits him. And it actually has a kind of a cool rough texture to it as well. And of course, this is uh, the Harkonnen or Harkonnen from the current series, and they're kind of black and white, industrial, synthetic garb, which I wasn't sure about, including the you know being hairless. It definitely works for Raban, the whole beast thing. Fun fact, you know, in the book we meet him around the year ten one ninety ten one ninety one. At that point, he's old. He's almost 60 years old. He was born around 10-1-32. For comparison, the Baron Vladimir Hakurnin was born in 10-1-10. Yeah, the, the, the dates get long. They get even longer when you get into, like, God Emperor and beyond. But then again, Spice is a hell of a drug. So, um, you know, even though he's 60-ish, in universe, he's, you know, more like he's 35, 40. And, uh, yeah, in the film, they go for very much a synthetic aesthetic. Giddy Prime, Giddy Prime is uh, essentially an industrial hellscape. The planet's ecology is completely wrecked. Also, there's the whole thing about being under a black star, black sun, and that's why the f scenes are in black and white. I don't understand that. Uh, someone can explain if they want. I, I think, I, I don't see how that's scientifically, I think it's just artistic, and that's fine. Again, Frank Herbert himself didn't really worry too much about the science. You took magical space spice, and you could do whatever you need. So, hey, fine. I think he would, I think he would have approved. Fun fact, uh, Frank Herbert actually was one of the few fans back in the day of the David Lynch film in 84. I think he disliked the weirdness. And that's kind of the thing. The Harkonnens were a big part of the 84 film, but not really the Beast Raban here. He's just kind of a laughing brute moron in that film. He doesn't really do anything. In fact, he's even killed off scene uh, by the Emperor towards the end. In the miniseries 2000, he gets more to do. And gets a little more fleshed out. And he does get murdered by the Fremen, as in the book. But, yeah, he's not really much. In this film, especially film one, but even film two, he actually gets more. Uh, there's added scenes with him, some from the book, a lot that are just, you know, added. But it works. And I actually like the actor's portrayal of him. He's not smart. And he's, he's crazy. He, he, he flies off the handle very easily in the film. But he's not just a laughing lunatic like in 84. The, the, the Raban in 84 would never have done anything done. And in the books, he wasn't clever. He wasn't playing 3D chess. He wasn't probably even playing 2D chess. But he was one of the few to actually caution against the hidden power of the Fremen, whereas everyone else, including the Emperor, dismissed them. And... He had at least enough common sense when dealing with the Baron to step back and say things. He wasn't that dumb, even if his survival was more animalistic than anything else. He would have definitely not passed the box test. And even though he was a count, even though he was governor of Arrakis for a couple of years, at least in the book, I'm not really crazy about in the film how they did away with the two-year time skip. I think it was necessary in the book. But they didn't. They just made it into, you know, maybe half a year at most in the movie. There was still a time skip, but, yeah. But no, I did, I did like him. And it's a neat Build-A-Figure. He's, he's taller. He's more like eight inches. He's very chunky. Not a lot of articulation. He does have joints and everything, but he's just so big, and he's got these crusty robes. And I'm actually glad they're not cloth on him. Because it is kind of pleather in the in the film, and that actually presents well. But yeah, this is him from film one. You can tell 
He's at least in a somewhat calm position here. And so, you know, as, as a free figure and the only really bad guy we got in kind of a unique body mold, why not? I do wish he came with the stand, though, but I'm at least happy he did come with a couple of uh, weapons. And uh, one's definitely from the books. I don't remember if they mentioned him having a cleaver sword, but it fits him very well. So that was our first Harkonnen, and uh, really the only one we have in film one. We didn't get a figure of the Baron, at least not in the standard wave. They, they did do a, a tall version, like a 12-inch scale, but I want to keep my stuff in scale. I thought it was kind of strange they didn't do a Baron, but eh, oh well. And in the first film, we didn't even see the Beast's brother. But in film two, we definitely did. Fade, Raltha, Harkonnen. Soon to be Na Baron after his birthday. He's definitely featured more than his brother, and he's much younger. When we first meet him, he's 16. And by the end, he's just turned 19, again in the books. So he's just slightly older than Paul. And he's actually part of the Bene Jesuits uh, breeding program. In fact, they were supposed to marry, except Jessica kind of screwed that up. Um, yeah, the Bene Gesserit are not squeamish about some incest, I, I tell you. Again, Frank Herbert for you guys. Drugs, 60s. And the funny thing is, in book one, there's not a lot of direct sex. But boy, howdy, by uh, books five and six, he's a dirty old man. In fact, he, he passed away not long after book six. And... Uh, he was only like 66 when he died, maybe even 65. But uh, he, he gave two fucks about sex and just threw it threw it all out. He was not approved. I'll give him that. Anyway, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, fade. Uh, very famous in 1984, portrayed by Sting. Although the original casting of Mick Jagger would have been just... <laughs> Uh, the, the, the 2000 portrayal, he had more to do in the 2000 miniseries. I, I think he was closer to the book in the 2000 series. Like he's supposed to be a brooding, he's basically a goth kid in the book. Unfortunately, like a goth kid, he's also annoying. Sting was much cooler than he would have been. So, you know, some changes are for the better. The, I forget, I don't know, he played him in 2000, but. He's all right, but mm. this guy, Elvis, was uh, Austin Butler. Uh, again, wasn't in the first film, and I didn't know how it was going to work off. Uh, again, Fade's supposed to be a bit of a pretty boy, but also a gladiator, a, a cheater, but a gladiator. And you know, taking his hair away in, in the in the book, he had black hair, and uh, of course, he's bald now and all that. I didn't know how that'd work out. It worked out. He does come across as older in the uh, in the film. He still comes across as young, don't get me wrong. But there's something just absolutely genteel and psychotic about him. I actually do believe he's an aristocrat in the film. Which is not something you often get from the, the Harkonnens in any adaptation. And I do get that he's intelligent. And I actually do like that they included the box scene of him getting tested, too, because he was another potential Kwisat Sadarak. And, uh, yeah, the, the Margot Fenring, that was interesting. The, it, that was in the book, but it wasn't in the 2000 miniseries. Of course, it wasn't in 84 because a lot wasn't. <clears throat> he's a thing. He, he's a psychopath. I, 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 it was... Not exactly like the book, and I mean that in a good way. Uh, interesting portrayal. I think it may go down as at least the best fade we've had on, on film. Uh, Sting is definitely memorable, but it just didn't get enough time in the film, and it's Sting. This was its own thing, and he did have that rock star presence, and I did like the fight scene with the Atreides lieutenant in the arena. And I did like that even though he's a bastard and a psychopath, that um, he has a sense of honor. Like, he he might cheat, but at least he'll compliment you for fighting and won't 
he seems to have a lot more respect for his opponents than just, you know, sycophants. So what's neat about this figure, it's it's a whole new mold for Series 2 with all new Schwartz. And we have a cape. And it is wired. Kind of plugs in. Again, it's, it's a very kind of industrial, insectoid, slick, oily, leathery. And it actually comes across in the figure very well. And he's actually quite mobile, quite flexible. Because like Paul, he's, he's reedy. He's a sword fighter. And he is legitimately a skilled fighter. My only complaint with him in the film... I kind of wanted more of Austin Butler's portrayal. A, few, a couple more scenes with Fade would have been awesome. And I did like the added scene of uh, the, uh, the Baron f uh, f uh, forcing the beast to kiss his boots. What a scene. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I don't know. This is interesting. He was at least legitimate and interesting. And uh, I can't remember, did I say in the film? I think it did. But yeah, he killed his mother, and uh, that was okay because uh, Glossu Ravon killed their father. So uh, yeah, N nice uh, patricidal, matricidal uh, guys there. Charming. Fit right in with the Harkonnen, though. They really do. And uh, yeah, he was the Na Baron, and it did show him being quite more competent on Arrakis, on Dune, and again, I would have... I liked another scene or two with him. Uh, maybe the plot with him trying to kill the the Baron. But then again, maybe not. Um, it is what it is. But yeah, this was a new one for Series 2. And I guess was the first bad guy we really got in the just kind of the main series. Had to think about it. Yeah, you can kind of position this. However you want. White glove, black glove, poison, no poison. Gladiator. Pretty neat. At least I think so. What do you think? We have another Raban. Raban. This is from the Gurney 2-pack. I think it's just for those who didn't get the Build-A-Figure. And uh, it just comes pre-assembled. I think it is the same exact figure. I don't think they even changed the head on this one. But again, since the first one wasn't retail release, that's okay. While the sword seems the same, we did get a unique mold for the Inkvine Whip. With it more an action pose. Because it's supposed to be a fight scene between him and Gurney. While uh, Brian Herbert goes into rather excruciating detail about Raban and Gurney's history... Frank leaves it rather vague, but it's clear that Raban brutalized and killed Gurney's family. Again, he was originally on Gidi Prime in the slave pits. And uh, Raban gave him the scar with this whip, and it's kind of an iconic weapon of his. And uh, again, in the book... It's the Fremen who kill him because they rather hate him because he brutalized him for a couple of years. In the newest film, there is that duel with him and Gurney. It's a change, but I think it fits. I do like that it wasn't a long, drawn-out duel. He just Gurney just kills him because Gurney is just infinitely better. And uh, at that point, Raban is running scared. Kind of the theme of animal versus human in the film. From the books, too. So the, I like that it was just a quick and dirty death for Raban. Even then, he's somewhat of a slightly tragic character. I know that's weird, and I don't get that in the book, especially the prequels, but you can tell that he's just spat upon and whatever by his family, and so he takes out his rage on those under his power, which is obviously horrendous, but... He's definitely not treated with any respect by anyone. He's just a brute. And he dies like a brute. You'd think in 60 years he probably killed a lot of folks. 
But now we draw towards the end of the film. For the big fight scene at the end of the film and the two leading contenders at the end of the Bene Gesserit breeding program, the two that, if the sexes were different, would have married, McFarlane gave us a two-pack. But the truth is, it really should have been a three-pack. This should have been the set. End of Duel Paul, and End Fade, and in the center, of course, Emperor Shaddam IV of the Golden Lion Throne, House Carino, Padishah Emperor, a house that had been in power for 10,000 years. But yeah, this should have been a three-pack, and there's a reason. A lot of the sets are pretty heavy on accessories. The the Fremen set, we'll call it, had the extra head, it had the two rocket launchers, it had a cloak. That was pretty neat. The um, the Gurney and Raban set had a total of four weapons, plus the new Gurney figure and, you know, the, the, the put-together Raban. And the Amazon four-pack set had unique versions of those figures, plus quite a few goodies, maybe the most of any of them. This two-pack just comes with Paul, Fade. Paul has his usual Chris knife, and Fade does have a unique short sword belonging to the Emperor himself, as per the film. And Shaddam IV himself, as a figure, comes with this. Just him and a big baggy cloak. He does have a pointy hand. No accessories. He's the only figure in the entire line not to have any kind of accessory. That's odd. I think they just banked on the fact that we would buy him because it's Christopher Walken. I admit, the casting of Christopher Walken as the Emperor is a little strange. But much like with Fade Rotha, I found myself wanting one or two more scenes with him. It's Christopher Walken. I, was it maybe the best choice in casting? No, maybe not. But it's the most unique and memorable, kind of like having Sting in the 84 film. People will remember that Christopher Walken was in it. Maybe he wanted to be in it. Let's be honest, Christopher Walken is getting to be in his mid-80s. We aren't going to have him, at least as an active actor, for much longer. So I'm going to take any role we can get with him. He's just... It's like Sean Connery. Just Some people are just institutions. Like, if Sean Connery wanted to be in your film, you would, you let him. And Shaddam is an interesting character in the books, and I don't feel like anyone has really been perfectly cast. The miniseries or the 84 film, I don't feel like we're perfect. Because he's not... In some ways, he's worse than the Baron, in some ways better. In some ways, I think he really did love or care for Leto Atreides, but... That's also dangerous for someone like him because that's a threat, and he trusted the Baron because he didn't respect him. So, yeah, and that does come across a bit. I do like that he has the pointing hand. I think if they didn't want to give him accessories, they could at least given him interchangeable hands or maybe an alternative head, or you know, a teacup. <laughs> I mean, he was drinking tea, so a tea set would have been very apropos. We do have quite a nice robe. But that's it. Okay, mm -hmm. very bland figure. So I thought that's why I think he should have just come with this uh, set. But at least he's a unique one. It's not just someone in a still suit. Kind of interesting. We didn't get a Princess Irulan. Oh well. We could have got a uh, seducing fade Margot. So yeah, we get these two. And yeah, these are almost the same as the previous Paul and Fade, but not quite. And they're unencumbered by robes and what have you. Let's uh, first look at Fade. Here he is, and he is holding the Emperor's sword. In the film, he's a captive after the Fremen take over Eriking. So he's been disarmed. Once the f challenge is thrown down, well, I mean, I guess Paul could have fought a 90-year-old man, but instead, you know, he picks Fate as his champion, so he gives him his sword. 
So that would have been one possible accessory to give the Emperor was his sword. But I also understand why they wanted to kind of keep it for this pack because it's the kind of one unique piece and it's pretty iconic and it looks very different from the Atreides or the Harkonnen or the Fremen weapons. Very much a showpiece. These are kind of a soft rubbery thing. One thing I'll say, they're not too badly warped when they come out sometimes, but they're easy to heat up and straighten out. But I'd rather have them wiggly where they'll bend rather than break, because if you have a bunch of swords on a shelf and they're too rigid, they will snap. So we have Fade here. He's pretty much the same, except no cloak, but we do get a new head. Complete with his uh, Harkonnen dental work. And if you want, you can pop the heads off. They're completely interchangeable. The whole series pretty much is, which is nice. But yeah, he's unencumbered by his robes and just kind of, you can really move him around. And I like that you can easily get this other hand than a fist because in their fight, they were doing plenty of hand-to-hand -hand and foot-to-foot -foot contact, not just stabby thing. It's kind of interesting. You see a lot of sword fights or you know, lightsaber fights or whatever, but Dune's unique in that it's more like dagger fights or knife fights, which is a different game. We don't see him wearing armor. We don't see him wearing shields on Arrakis Dune because uh, shields are said to attract uh, the worms, and uh, maybe they could use them within the city, but a lot of times you just don't see shields used. Instead, they just rely on speed. Again, even if he maybe uses underhanded tactics in the arena or he fights some drug slaves on Giddy Prime, Fate is a good fighter. And that kind of shows in the Paul figure. Well, we do get his usual creased knife. The head is a little different. For one, the nose apparatus is down. His hair is a little, uh, quite a bit more must than we saw in the first figure. And he's got some blood on his face because he does take some blows. That's one kind of nice thing is he's not invulnerable. Prussians or not. By this point, he's definitely Pa Muadib, even Pa Izeo Gaib, Pa Mahdi. Not the gun, the, you know, savior. Final fight scene. So, yeah, his new thing is basically just a different head but the same crease knife. But I don't know what else he could have, I mean, realistically. And, of course, we get an unencumbered one, Series 2, no robes, because we don't need them. So it's a very basic set. I mean, two figures, two knives, two stands. That's why I think having the Emperor thrown in as a freebie would have made a nice three-pack. But... Oh, well, again, I'm not going to complain for what these cost. This this pack was $29, I think is what I paid. So actually, a little more, almost as much as a four-pack from Amazon. But I think the, the final duel kind of aspect gave it a little more attraction for folks. What do you think? I've heard reviews online. They said the Series 2 paint job is better than series one i know that mcfarland's paint isn't as good as say hasbro's or neca's but the sculpt feels good and one nice thing about being blind is i don't have to see the paint so it didn't really bother me overall i do like the final duel scene i like the uh, kind of introduction of hello cousin i've been looking for that that whole thing and 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 just the reaction on fade is quite good to the character and uh, I do like the you fought well Atreides, you know, echoed from earlier. There's just one thing I don't like, one thing missing. One thing that I was just waiting for, we didn't get. We need the sting. I will kill him. Just shouting it louder. And I, okay, it's corny. We probably didn't actually need that. But <laughs> yeah. I, I think even to me, that it was definitely better than the 2000 fight scene. It just had more going on. Even with uh, everything else. It wasn't too quick. wasn't over 
but it also wasn't drawn out. And no, I think it was well paced. In fact, I, I just feel like the second film was well paced. Uh, the first film was a little rushed in areas and maybe a little overindulgent in others. I feel like the pacing was a little off on the first film, but the second one took its time. I would have maybe taken a couple of scenes away from the Fremen and Paul and given a little more to the Emperor, maybe one more to the Emperor, one more scene, and maybe one more to the Harkon. Because, um, you know, the the Baron is kind of overshadowed in both films, uh, especially in the second one. And that's okay. Sometimes the Baron got too much focus anyway and fades really the future of House Harkonnen. In fact, I believe he ended up, yeah, he had a daughter with uh, Margot, so technically the bloodline would continue. But since he was not Baron and then briefly Baron, or at least presumptive Baron of the house and then killed, it kind of folds things into themselves. Of course, with Paul being part Harkonnen himself and also part Atreides. Yeah, and then marrying House Carino. If him and Irulan had had offspring, they would have had elements of all three houses. But yeah, the final fight scene, the figures, uh, I think it's kind of interesting. Just needs more cowbell. So there you have it. Yeah, I customized a few a little bit. Had fun. I said they are parts interchangeable. Of course, there's reuse. But honestly, there's more differences between them than I thought. And at least when they did like different head sculpts, they, they did actually change. It wasn't just a paint change. Because some, some things, it literally is just different paint and different brands. And for the money and for what you get, I had fun. Why not? Again, Dune has always been very cerebral and really influenced modern science fiction, kind of alongside Star Trek. Definitely before Star Wars had a lot of influence on that. All those greats did. Arthur Clarke. Asimov is a particular favorite of mine. I read all the original Foundation books and even some of the newer ones back in the day. I just really enjoyed that kind of stuff, especially summertime. That was my time to read. Science fiction of that type was just summertime. But, yeah. Even the 84 film I enjoyed. I mean, back when it came out, it's what we had. And, uh... Enjoyed it more when I discovered things to smoke when I was a teenager. The The 2000 miniseries was entertaining. Uh, it was it was nice to have a sci-fi channel. It was a novelty back then, back when it was really actually sci-fi. That was on there. You had Farscape. You had reruns of some old things like the original BSG before the revamp came out. And, uh, of course, soon you had the extension of SG-1 from... Showtime to them. But yeah, I agree. It was about time someone was to do another adaptation. In some ways, the new films are big Hollywood. But at least they do feel like they have a soul. I'll, I'll give them that. Uh, there's obviously more battle. If you, in, in the books, there's not a lot of battle scenes. It's mostly talking and dialogue. Which is interesting for a book, not so interesting for an adaptation, I know. And considering a lot of actors from superhero films are in this, it's really no wonder that McFarlane got the license to do it. It's kind of that property. They're not perfect figures, but again, for the money, they're fine. Perfectly fine. I mean, would I have liked it if NECA did it? Oh, yeah. I think NECA could have knocked some Dune figures out of the park. But they also would have been double the cost and probably harder to get and smaller numbers. And we probably still would have a lot of the same because NECA definitely does repeats and repaints too. Just look at all the Predators. So, meh, yeah, what the hey. I don't know if we'll get a Wave 3. We were honestly lucky to get a wave two. If Dune Part Three, presumably based on Masai, does get made, then maybe we'll get something from that. We can get a face dancer. We can get Gola Duncan. <laughs> yeah. We can get insane possessed Alia. <laughs> anyway, 
Just something to talk about, something topical. Why not? But I'd like to know your opinions on the whole Dune franchise, the Dune universe. I, I honestly think right now the internet is kind of a just conglomeration is just all full of praise of the films. I think that'll settle down and people will find faults in time as always happens when something's really new, people get all hot and bothered. But I think overall in history it'll be pretty well remembered. But time will change perception. It always uh, always does. It's kind of how it goes. So, yeah, don't be disappointed if then in a year the trend online is to kind of denigrate it or have videos, oh, it wasn't as good as you thought, or is it as good, or, you know, faults, blah, blah, blah. It's inevitable. But right now it's still riding a pretty high tidal wave. Alrighty, folks. I better get back to my actual job. <laughs> this is Misha. Catch you very soon next time.